Greetings everyone, wherever you are. Hope you're doing very well. This is a collaboration video between me and another YouTuber who is very passionate about our languages, cultural heritage, and of course our identity. Please head off to her channel to see her very interesting interview of me after you've watched this video, of course. I will leave her YouTube channel information in the description below this video so you can watch her videos and learn more um, about a song language and more. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel, what are you waiting for? Subscribe today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy this interview. You will not be disappointed. So, um, so everyone who's watching us, um, I want you to meet someone whom I consider um, one of the advocates of African languages. Yes, she is Nigerian. No, she does not speak every language, but she's the one who believes that we have to do something for um, in order for our languages not to die. So she has taken up upon um, on herself this task of promoting a song language. And she um, has a YouTube channel where she is talking about, you know, a song language and is teaching others to speak this language. So today you'll meet Abel Mabel, <laughs> um, who is um, very happy to be able to talk to us some more about um, herself and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, Diaspora Speaks Yoruba family. <laughs> my name is Mabel and uh, my YouTube channel uh, title is Abel Mabel. Uh, how that name came about would be a story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really, I feel privileged to be on um, Rashida's uh, platform. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually, I say a little bit about my channel. Esan is one of the minority languages in Nigeria, and uh, I'm just doing my little best, really, my little bit <laughs> to try and do the best I can and see how far I can encourage both minority language speakers in Nigeria and the majority speaker ones like Yoruba. So, and to see how we can all really work together because I feel a joint effort we enable us to go a long way. Yeah, that's me. And you're doing a good job because like I told you, I said, I never, ever heard about heard about it song ever and so i came across your channel after you commented on a video that i made and i thought okay oh oh so it's an eye-opening thing and you're i mean you're doing a wonderful job so we thank you for that and so i have a question for you what what is what is the origin the um, etymologically speaking what is a song what is Isan people? What, where, did, where does the word Isan come from? But what is it really? Okay. Um, if people go to my channel, the very first introductory video, I try to explain because I know not a lot of people we know uh, uh, about Isan in Nigeria. We are not, we are small, but we are not really that small, small. So, um, those who are not from Nigeria, you all know that we have currently have 36 states in Nigeria. I always have to be careful because the we last time I studied states in Nigeria, it was when it was 12 states. <laughs> so, uh, so, and then my state was called Bender State. So mm -hmm. those who grew up in Nigeria, we know the popular Bender State, which was in originally from when Nigeria was in three, four regions, it was the Midwestern state. And obviously, initially, when Nigeria was created by the colonial masters, the very first regions were three regions, the northern, the eastern, and the south, uh, western region. Right. So but in, eventually, I think in the 60s, um, the Midwestern region was created. Midwestern region later became known as the Bender State. Then when they started splitting up the state, like uh, Amoeba splitting up left, right, and center, <laughs> creating so many states, they eventually split Bender State into two. So it's now Edo State and Delta State. The ASAN is part of Edo State. 
the Esa language from history or a tradition is that we are we are descended from the Bini kingdom, which is the Edo, from the Edo people, the Binis. Mm -hmm. So um, the history part of the story is that the then Oba had, um, I think he was bereaved, he lost one, his son, his other son or the only son. And he now declared a period of mourning in the whole kingdom and he forbade cooking and <laughs> So many other normal things that people would do in life. He said he was mourning. Those were his grieving. Those things he was do, uh, uh, doing at the time. He expected the whole kingdom to do the same. So, but they say a lot of people started um, leaving the kingdom. So that's where the word Esa come from. In Benin language, Esa means a fear. It means they jumped away. So ah. then, then it later was. Uh, kind of cut out to become a son. But unfortunately, when the colonial master came, they changed it to Isha. Ah. So when you speak to people who actually grew up in Nigeria, some people will know us as Isha. It's just like the Igbo are now reclaiming their, norm, their, uh, their term, their name Igbo. as Igbo. Yeah. So, so also we are also now saying we're actually a son, not Isha. I actually don't know the rationale behind changing it to Isha. I feel Isha is actually easier to say than Isha. So yeah, so but most people will still generally know us as Isha. When you hear people say Isha, you see the same thing. But we are reclaiming the Esa. So everybody say Esa now. But even, trust me, even some people who are from Esa still don't even still know the difference. Some people still feel, or some people will say Esa is the, is the people or the land. Isha is the language, but it's not. It's they are one, one the in the same, same. right? Yeah. So they are one in the same, the people, the language. Okay, and so the pronunciation of the word is what I want to get. When I've listened to you speak, <laughs> you know how we go from English, English to our own languages? We, yeah. When we're speaking English and we use the, a word in our language within that English sentence, we tend to put the English tone or English sound on that word. So I want you to please, for all our viewers <laughs> and for me, pronounce it's not the way it's supposed to be. You told me it's nasal, right? So uh, some ways, uh, but I would because obviously I'm the native speaker, so yeah. I wouldn't really see it as nasal on this particular word. But it's a sa, a sa, sa. So the a n actually is no nasal because a n is one of the nasal sounds we have in a sa. A so it's a sa, a a a a. Sa. Yeah. Okay. I think yeah. I got it. <laughs> I think I got it. And I thank you for that. Okay. So, um, so the question I was going to ask you, um, part of the first question I just asked is what does it mean? And you touched on that, which is that the people jump based on what the Oba did. Right. Yeah. So, um, of course I would have jumped too, if, <laughs> if, if that were Me happening, <laughs> If it were happening where I live, where we couldn't do normal things. So yeah, that's a that's good right. bit of history you've given us. So what is, um, what, um, when I was listening, I, I was watching one of your videos and I saw Bodiaye. Okay, I hope I'm pronouncing that way. And that, that's how I'm are you? There. You're very good, actually. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So that is, a great, so that's how are you to someone, like an individual, and um, uh, I'm not gonna look at my note. I'm gonna remember this. Uh, Ofure, right? Yeah, Wait, okay. Huh? Yeah. Hey? yeah you, you did very well, actually. I'll okay. give you a chart of ten on both of them. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> hey, look, I, I you know I love language. I I love and I love to take on the challenge. So, but this is um, so when I looked at those words. I could, I love to break down words. And you remember I asked you about the origin of Esan. And so when I look at the um, Bodiaye and Ofure, I thought, wait, I could see some words or from some other languages in it. I'm going to explain myself. <laughs> so Bodiaye to me, I body is like pigeon English. It's like your body. How's your body? I think Esa came before the Pigeon English. So, okay. so I would find it very difficult to think 
um, and the pidgin is the general language in Nigeria. So Thank actually, you. people who know us very well, we say the old Bende state used to be known as the specialist in pidgin English. So <laughs> it was our like, because uh, uh, those state of Bende state is another, we used to actually laugh at ourselves that we are the mini Nigeria, because like the, the Yorubas, even if you have your different dialect, you still can understand each other. But within the Edo state or the, or the old Bende state, there were so many other dialects within it that you can't understand each other. If an Edo man or a Bini man is speaking, a some person can hardly understand. You would pick one or two words. You can't understand everything they say. Even you move a step further to Isako or one or the others. And in the old Benders, you used to have the Robo, Ishekiri, mm -hmm. uh, Ijo, Isoko. Then you have part of the Delta Ibo as well, the Agbo and the and the the Agbo and the um, was Asaba. So, okay, I'm so to the end of the, the at the end of the River Niger before you cross to Onitsha. So uh -huh. it was we used to actually say we are the mini Nigeria, or that sometimes we tease ourselves that that's where the Tower of Babel, as it says <laughs> in the Bible, that fell down because we can't really understand each other. And when you move further to Akoko Edo, they are almost like the boundary between the houses. And you move towards the other part where they have boundary with Ondo State. They all also miss, and they also have some part where they almost speak Yoruba. They have Yoruba names, so it was and, almost like. And uh, that's we that's just, what I've that's what I've experienced. On that note, so yeah. okay, so like I told you, I never heard. I just thought Edo people speak Igbo language. That's what yeah. I thought, that's and I'm sure a lot of thing. Nigerians think that. And but by uh, you coming out and some others too, I know it's it's not really. Um, we don't have as many people talking about a sound language in you know um, online. But with your help, it looks like our eyes are opening. Because but I'm I still want to tell you kind of like expound on how I was able to break down what made me remember those yeah. greetings so that you know. Um, I could easily say them to you like I just did <laughs> today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, to me, when I heard that, I saw, okay, so maybe, so so you said you believe, and I'm, I'm sure you're right, because Pigeon came later. I mean, we all had our languages. We've been here, Africans have been here since forever, since the beginning of time. English actually came before Pigeon. No, exactly. But Pigeon came as a way for all of us to communicate in the That's streets right. and our marketplaces, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Yeah. So for um, body aye to me, I could hear Yoruba in it, and I'll explain. I could hear, I could hear, see a, a pigeon word in it. So the 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 etymons that I see are um, English, Yoruba, and um, and pigeon. And let me, and I'm going to explain. So body, like I was saying earlier, means the body. Okay, aye is like it will be well in Yoruba, and um, when you say aye. It's like it will make it, it will be viable, it'll be well. So for me, it was easy for me to remember that. But but body aye. Okay. So then I said, how can I remember um ofure? And I said in Yoruba, ofo, ofure, um, ofore, depending on your dialect, it means um it 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 speaks well, it is well. You know what I mean? So when I thought when I heard you. Um, translated into English, and I thought, oh goodness, I could easily, this is great. So I thought I'd ask you, <laughs> I, hey, hey, look, it'll help me remember those greetings, but I thought I'd ask you that question just to see whether there is any relationship between, you know, these origins and the, the word. Um, uh, if the history, if we look at the history, move back, back, back to many other centuries, mm -hmm. some people actually say, the Benins are descended from the Yorubas, but some of the school of thought said, oh, Benin kingdom has always been there before the Yoruba. You know, is I think because our histories are not, our history is not, they're they are not written down, yeah. they're oral. Mm -hmm. So it's always difficult to argue. It depends on, people have research and have proof why they came to those um, uh, uh, answers mm -hmm. or whatever school of thought they belong to. But however, I just feel that's part of the reason why I actually feel we should be dialoguing together, especially between these languages and our cultural heritage, because 
I feel even in Nigerian school, you did some part of your secondary school, I guess, in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Until, for example, until I read um, Che Mamanda, I hope I'm saying her first name correctly, uh, Adeche. Che Amanda. Adeche. Oh, am I saying it? Yeah, I think it's Che Amanda. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, let me know. I always look at her name the way the alphabets come before, before I actually say it. Until I read her half of the yellow sun, mm -hmm. that's what actually gave me a fuller picture of the Biafran war. Nobody ever talked about that part of our history, secondary school history. All our history we did in secondary was about Mongo Park and all those <laughs> Rubbish. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, to it's, say I mean, it's, it's on the a truth. national, on it's a national the truth. platform. We, we needed so, to know what happened, the, the facts, not you that's know, right. Yeah. That's right. It was just only one narrative from the victors, which was informed by the colonial masters. Exactly. And, and you know why? Is, you, you not, know, I don't really want to make this so controversial, but, but you that's know why? If I may interrupt yeah. you, you know why. Yeah. So history has taught us that if we if we remember what happened in the past we can make better decisions in the current yeah. time to secure the future. So if our history is, first of all, is, it has been oral, we're just beginning to document our history. That's right. So if it has been oral and we, um, and it's been sort of like blurred where we don't have the full information that we are owed by those who are who came before us, then yeah. they, we're bound to make mistakes. And I guess talking about it the way we are now and the way everybody has begun to talk about it is what we need and is, is helpful to us. Absolutely. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so, so the body I hear, literally, we just grow, you know, a language, you just grow up saying it, you don't really think about the pronunciation or the meaning. So body I hear literally mean, it's just like the way you're about to say Bawoni. So we, but yeah, it's just uh, people actually, some some part of a uh, state of Bini or old Bender say we actually, when they want to say the kind of what the literary or jokey way of describing, we say the body are your people. <laughs> so, yeah, because because whenever we see each other, it's the first thing you say, you just say body are here or fure, or there's even a, a longer way of saying it, or dear me, me. That means it is really, it's very, very good. So yeah, but when you are teaching somebody or dear man, man, so but when you are teaching somebody very well in the beginning, just to try and keep it simple, you just say ofure, you know. So yeah. So, so and yeah, for yeah, those, ofure, just. okay, and for those who may have not seen um, Abel Mabel's video, whom I know as Auntie Mabel. Um, or if you do not know, what we're talking about is the greeting, how you greet an individual and how they respond, which is we're saying, how are you? Fine, thank you. So, but they are yeah, and they're ofure, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's exactly what we're saying. So you've learned a word or two today, if you didn't know that. <laughs> so um, so I, I've enjoyed watching you on YouTube. Um, thank you. And, and I, I really think, you know, I woke up one day after realizing that my children speak, that I've actually done something that a lot are not doing. And after so many have approached me saying, hey, Rashida, you should do this, you should do that, put this out to help other people. Um, and I think something ministers to our spirit that makes us go, you know what, I'm going to take this beyond my walls or beyond my circle and I'll put it in that, you know, out in the air because, it's, it's something that, I mean, thank God for you too, we're now able to do all of this. So as I watch your video, I see someone who is trying to add value to the world because, you know, we all, you know, little drops of water make a mighty ocean, right? So you are adding to the word and I commend you for that. Thank you. You're welcome. So my question to you is what made you? So before you answer the question, for me, I, I realized that my children are doing something that a lot of people are telling me that is there, nobody's doing. So, okay. So it was hard to come on. So eventually I came, I recorded the video, I waited, and then eventually I came out. And then I came out, I was like, okay, how will people take this, you know? And then I got very many positive results and that drove me and it's still driving me. And I thank those who have been positive because the more people see videos, of that are promoting our cultures, our languages, our traditions, the more we'll be able to get it out to more people and the more more people will see it and it will help us generationally. So what made you start your YouTube video, um, your YouTube channel? Right, um, there's some similarities in your uh, uh, raising as well. Um, I have been living in the UK 
for a little bit over 30 years. <laughs> and when I was at home, I didn't, okay, the language was spoken a lot more, we were speaking it a lot more than what they do now. So obviously, as you know, you come to diaspora, you don't really, you try to settle down and all of that. So before you know it, you go back home. So the first time I went back home was about 10 years later. And I was so shocked to see that everybody, almost everybody were speaking English to their children, even those who couldn't even speak good English. They were speaking pidgin English to their children. Even grand, some grandparents who could hardly even speak English properly were just speaking very bad, broken English to their children. <laughs> it was almost like a form of civilization to say your children don't speak your dialect. Mm -hmm. So I was so shocked. And this is me, I'm in diaspora. I just feel like fish out of water. I'm really, I was really, Missing, you know, when you leave home, you're really missing home, and yes, you you be seen as the other. And you no, know, but people, the first time they you open your mouth to talk, they ask you where are you from originally and stuff like that. So and uh, so I was really surprised, and I told, I asked my, I remember asking one of my brothers, I said, why are you guys doing this? And uh, they said, oh, um, because uh, there's, there was, there's a university in my town now. So I mean, they're obviously from when, just before, I, actually in my time, it's the university started when I was about to, when I was in my later years of secondary school. Mm -hmm. So, and it's like the demonstration, nursery primary school, it's like the in thing everybody wants to get their children into. Mm -hmm. And for your child to get into that nursery at the age of four or so, they need to be able to speak English very well. That's what they are tested. On. So that is why everybody now see it as if speaking English and good English to your children, your children being able to speak English will be the one that take them somewhere. And also I reflected back as well, I can see that it wasn't just, it didn't start today because when we were in the boarding school, but at home actually, when I was growing up, I spoke a sound first. It's when I started primary school before I start, obviously I'm in my fifties. I don't want to give my age away, so I'm not- No, you're, you're fifth, in your fifties looking twenties, so go ahead. <laughs> thank you. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, when, when we, then our parents, many of our parents couldn't speak English. So all we knew to, how to speak was our dialect, which is ESA. Then mm -hmm. we started primary school and we started learning English and ESA was actually be taught in school those days because we couldn't write ESA when we are home. So it was mm. when in prim primary one, you are being taught the ABD, which is the African alphabet, the way you are being taught the one, two, three, how to actually, you know them, but that's when you are taught how to write them. You right. learn them alongside right. English. But when we now got to secondary school, what they call in UK, the 11 plus, you then you have to do the exam. It's not like now that people just can take their children to very good schools or whatever and pay high fee paying school. There were no private secondary boarding school. There were even no private secondary school to be honest. So mm -hmm. to get into the boarding school, you got to pass the common entrance. And in the boarding school, you are meant to speak English as well because as we all go live to live our various home and go to boarding school, we always tend to congregate in our dialect group because you're feeling lost. You are 11 years old or 12 years old. You've left home for the first time. So the least person you gravitate to is somebody who speaks the same language as you. That's right. So they right. always watch out for those little groups and, pen, and find a way to punish us or fine you for speaking your dialect. Mm -hmm. So when I had really reflected, I said, this thing has been going on actually, this conditioning not to, to see our language as not as very good or not right. necessary to right. succeed right. in life. That's the vernacular. So, that's that's our, right. our languages are considered that, right? That's like right. That. So anyway, that was when I now felt, I said, ah, I'm in the UK. I can see the Asians speaking their language. The, the Chinese speaking their language. And even especially the Igbos and the Yorubas, we still, when you go to the parties and stuff, they still speak their language more than we do, the minority ones. Right. So that was where the idea came from. So actually when we started the charity in 2011 back home, I actually said they should start ASAM classes alongside it. And we had four stations where they were, I mean, we bought the materials, books, blackboard, even give the children free notebook and mm -hmm. we appointed volunteer teachers. But along the way, it just died a natural death. So even at a point, I really wanted to, to sustain it. I even said they should find a teacher mm -hmm. who will be paid monthly and who will be going, doing one day a week, each of the four stations. But right. they just couldn't find anybody who, who was reliable enough to do it. So when YouTube started, especially around 2018, 2019, 
I never even knew YouTube existed that much. But when I started watching videos on YouTube, then it now dawned on me that, oh, Mabel, you need to do something. You couldn't do something locally. I think this is a way to actually reach people globally. And even there are a lot of Niger some people scattered all over Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Majority of my family members are in Lagos. Now some are moving to Abuja because every capital city is where people congregate in Nigeria because that's mm -hmm. where you have most opportunity. <laughs> so true. yeah, that was why the idea came But It was so daunting. I, pro I, I thought of it, but I was so scared. There were a lot of uh, uh, reservation. It was like, I don't really speak this language enough. I don't, and within Eastern too, there are different dialects. And I was worried that if I start speaking my own dialect, I'm from Ekwoma, the town I'm from, mm -hmm. other people might not relate with it properly. Then right. it just got right. to a point during the pandemic, I just told myself, all right, maybe, you know, when you have this to-do list, you something you have to do. Pandemic came, everybody said, okay, I'm saving time on travel now. So, I'm locked down, I can't go anywhere, so why don't I do something? That was when I actually recorded the video eventually and I just put it out there. <laughs> and, and, and the love and the expression of the need and all of that started coming and that continued yes. to motivate you, I bet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There was just a few weeks after putting the first video in the young man in the US, mm -hmm. Ant uh, Antonio Taibbe left a comment on my YouTube and said he has Esa app. I was blown away. Oh my goodness. This is even an Eastern language app. I was so excited. So I contacted him. So he was the first person I interviewed on my channel. Okay. And from him, he told me about an author who has actually written Eastern books a long time ago. And I said, wow. So then I connected with the gentleman, Saudi Akbar. And then now I'm actually using his books on my channel. So yeah, you can see what just putting yourself out there then. So yeah, and uh, there's even an it's a market dot dot net. There's a okay. there's a, um, a, a website who says where they sell Essam books. So and other Essam stuff because Essam have a special cloth and stuff we do as a tradition. Okay. So okay. yeah, so all okay. of that he sells them on his website as well. Okay, that's good so, to know. Yeah, there's so much resources out there I never knew existed just yeah. by putting my the YouTube out there. Then exactly, isn't that what it takes? Though we, you know, like as I told you about me, I was afraid. I, I don't know if it was fear, but I just well, I was ambivalent. So I was like, yeah, nay, okay. But eventually, you know, once you do it, I, I think it, even if I didn't get positive feedback, I think I would have continued it because in my heart. I just knew it's something that, you know, we should we should do this because our languages are dying. I mean, we're already scattered. We're already away from home. We yeah. and um, you said something about when you went home 10 years after after leaving um, home, after having lived in the UK, you went home and you saw that everybody was speaking, you know, any form of something that's different from their native tongue, which was pidgin English, be it broken or not, they were still speaking in order to excel their children you know to to get them into schools right mm. so it looks like you know we did what was necessary at the time to get ourselves to a level and that's what i say too i will i always say our parents you know i remember my dad the same thing they just they would tell you no 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 you can't speak this you can't speak that and when when you do you know you you know you're you, it's a violation but what it has done for us is the opposite so that leads me to something else I want to know that I'm very interested in. In one of your videos entitled, Can My Children Learn Three or More Languages um, Simultaneously? You, you may mention of something that touches on what we're talking about, which is the mistakes that um, you said, I what, I what I would like is for the generations be, um, coming after us not make the same mistakes that the generations, my generation, yours, you said, and others before you have made. So I know that the languages are not taught, you know, people, all of us, we want to be cool. That's what I call it. Everyone wants to be cool, <laughs> want to be more, you know, on the, um, what is in, communicate with the world and all those things, but that has cost us. So aside from that, what are the mistakes that they, they, what, what are the mistakes that we should learn from? What are they? Can you break them down and tell me how we can resolve it? We, we know we're already doing the resolution part, but how can we further resolve it? But first of all, 
what are the mistakes that the generation before us made? Right, I've touched upon it a bit when, okay, like our parents did it unknowingly, they just wanted their children to be more educated and they were to achieve better grades and uh, you know, being able to go to the best universities or the best secondary schools and stuff like that, whatever mm -hmm. was available. Mm -hmm. then, then we, I swear, I think when people like myself, even those in Nigeria, they are still doing it now. Majority of people are doing it. They will speak a sound, their dialect to each other. And you see, even with the adults, we kind of miss the English and the dialect together when we are speaking. Mm -hmm. And the children will speak to them in English. And they, we just expect that they should pick it up. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. Like what you have proven is that you actually need to speak it to the children. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's part of the solution. I'll come to that. So but when, on the other hand, the added barrier is that you now move away from either your, your town or from Asa, you are now living in Lagos, in Abuja. Mm -hmm. And the best, the most important thing is just to survive. You know, when we move away across border again, we are now living in the UK. Yeah. And especially in the UK, people would think it's easier because um, you're, even those who move, who are even living in other European countries or other countries where they don't speak English uh, at all, that's a double uh, challenge mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So, but for us in the UK, you come in here and although you think you think you speak English, when you speak in your Nigerian accent or any of the African accent, people always look at you as if they don't understand you. As so if you don't I, speak English. As yes, <laughs> thank you. English. So so even when even when the, the those who are fr from French, who French speaking people like European that speak French, when they speak in their own accent and can hardly say the English word properly. People just excuse them and accept it. But for us, the Africans, sometimes we are looked down on. So but obviously, you are new in this foreign land and you are trying to find your feet as a parent. Probably you even your degree from Nigeria is not even accepted here. You are trying to think, oh, is it nothing I should do now or whatever, social work, or even you're a teacher back home. They, mm -hmm. they might want you to do a different, there's a, a one year degree you still have to do here to qualify as any, a teacher in England. Mm -hmm. So all of that, you're trying to find your free fine housing. And in our time, it was we came from the mentality. Once you have got married, you are expected to have children straight away. <laughs> they were not planned. There was nothing. And this is you. You come over here. You are living in a shared accommodation, one room. I know in US, probably, I don't know. You probably have what we call condo and big, big houses there. <laughs> but for us, Nigeria, uh, UK is an island. And you are sharing houses. In, living in one room and probably have popping out one or two children already and you still trying to go to one classes in the evening you're doing whatever job you can do maybe care catering or whatever meanwhile families back home are already expecting you to send some money because they feel you are plucking the queen's money queen's pounds as soon as you land in the airport you know so all of that and you you are thinking these people don't even understand me speaking English properly. But when you speak, people always say, can you say that again? Pardon? <laughs> and you got to, when you want to say the English, you are looking for a word that your accent or probably this there and all the other things they don't understand that you have to try and find a word that is easy to fit, is, can easily fit in. Mm -hmm. So in all of this, teaching your children your language just don't even come in at all. It's mm. like it's almost, it's relegated completely. I mm. think one of our biggest problem, the majority of us thought they would be confused. And this is you, you, you are already talking to a teacher who with your African accent, you think they are putting you down. They are not even, they are looking down on you. Mm -hmm. And you are running away, as you are dropping the child also, you are running to one job or the other. Mm -hmm. You're already like stressed. And you want your child to come into school again and saying, oh, but they are your full to the teacher, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so all of that fear, you just feel, uh, people like me, I was actually speaking my dialect at home to the children, but I wasn't uh -huh. consistent. I was just missing it with English, you know? Mm -hmm. Before I know it, the language just fell by the wayside. So these are all the problem we have. It's not that some of, uh, like I said, one of my videos, a teacher in my daughter's school actually said, encourage my husband and myself to speak, but it wasn't generally a courage. It wasn't like, a, if, a if the national curriculum or the education system encouraged us and said, oh, you all, you African immigrants, 
Mm. Make sure you speak like in in the uh, in, in UK in US where majority of the Spanish speak sp Spanish to their children. Then probably that would have sunk home, but mm -hmm. maybe wouldn't have to follow the advice. But yeah, th those are just all the barriers. Yeah. Oh wow! Excellent, excellent, <laughs> excellent point. <laughs> you had me laughing, <laughs> like because I can see these things you're talking about. I mean, I came here. You know, I'm a, I'm 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 younger than you, but I came here when I did. I came here. I did what is it? I did eleventh, so eleventh, eleventh and twelfth grade, which is I've left Nigeria system for so long, and I'm not familiar with um, how things are in Europe, but. Um, that's basically the third and fourth year before you'll go to, to college, to university. Okay. okay. So I did that. And I remember, <laughs> I remember the same things. I remember coming, I mean, I was young enough, you know, maybe that's why, you know, it was, it wasn't easy still. It wasn't easy, but these things make us understand why we easily we're pushed is what it is to throw our, the need to speak our languages away. Because I remember I had an accent, but they never teased me about my accent. I mean, they teased me about everything else. And this is probably why we don't, a lot of people hide from being African. You know, they hide from speaking the language. I spoke to an Igbo woman, an Igbo woman who said to me, she's ashamed to speak her language in public. She doesn't know why. I said, what is, she said, I'm so impressed. You're speaking, you're speaking to your children. And I said, yes, it's, you know, like I couldn't, I didn't understand it. Like I, that's me, that's the language is part of me. It's a, it's a gift. Yeah. So when I heard you say that, you know, when you came and, and what happens with our people um, and anyone who's listening to this, please use this as, as a guide. You know, we find ourselves trying to hustle to get to get through um things are less expensive where we came from you know where you know for in nigeria even no matter how bad things are when i look at the price of food the price of um just living living expenses they're not as bad as they are in 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 overseas away from home okay mm -hmm. as bad as the economy is today so a lot of parents are rushing like you said to do to make ends meet you are going to work, leave work, and it's a scheduled job, a shift job. You know, one has to be there on time. <laughs> so it's a lot of stress on the no family. No Africa time, no Nigeria time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, people, no, no African time in here. <laughs> Strictly, you're either on time. If you know, when you're on time, when you're early, that's being on time. You know what I mean? Like where you're yeah. you're there enough to log in, to clock in. And, you know, this is in the middle of a uh, climate that you're not used to. You know, you're coming and you're, you know, it's snowing. And I remember the first snow we had here. Oh, my gosh. I was asthmatic. I was r running against that snow and trying to catch the school bus. <laughs> and, and I was panting, trying to breathe, trying to get air. And I didn't experience that in my home country. You know, we didn't have that weather. It was sunny all day. And Hermitan was calm and just cool on your skin. Oh, I thought it was cold then, but coming to the US, oh, good God. <laughs> you know, this is cold weather. So we're, we're having to deal with, you mentioned moving away from home, having to deal with social um, stressors, um, the language barrier, or oh, not language, dialect, the sound, the tone of the voice, the barrier, um, all of that put together and having to deal with the day-to-day, -day, trying to make ends meet, paying huge rent money, mortgage money every month, all those things put together and trying to keep those families safe. Those are the factors that we all need to have in mind that have caused us um, to be losing our languages um, gradually in foreign lands. And so we need to be very mindful for those who are younger than me, my age, or who are even older or your age who are not aware of this or not, have not really thought about this. You've heard Auntie Mabel say it. These are the things that are causing us to lose our languages because we're not mindful of them because we're just living, right? We want to survive where we are. But if we, the youngins that are after me, if you are maybe which plan and have a family when you're ready, we, you, you're not under the, you know, our custom that says you need to be pregnant even before you walk down the aisle. <laughs> It should be about three months pregnant. You know what I mean? <laughs> so there's no need to rush and bring those children to this world so that you're not rushing to do this and doing that. But if that happens, it's okay. 
You know, you have a community of us around you now um, that are now pushing the languages out. And so we are going all going to be able to do it, but we all should be aware of those mistakes. So I guess the way we can um, resolve that is first being mindful of it, would you say? Yeah. Being mindful of it. In as much as some people that are just arriving, uh, diaspora, be it any part, maybe any part of Europe or UK, UK is within Europe, though they are no longer part of Europe. That's why I always say UK and Europe <laughs> these days, and US, you know, or any, whatever part of the world you end up in, even those who are within Nigeria, mm -hmm. is just to be mindful that. Um, I, I, let me just say, that I know some people will say, we are just arriving, we are in the same boat as you now. No, you're not, because where we came, we never had anybody to hold our hands or to <laughs> tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. The facilities these days, we are not, are not the way it is now. Even the asylum seeker, there are better plans for the asylum, better plans in place for the asylum seekers. Or if you just, now you come in through, if you came in through the right path, mm -hmm. you are coming in through either high school visa or something. So mm -hmm. are you always, there's huge community here actually to show you the ropes. So you are a better place. So first of all, those who are of my generation, there are two things that are where you begin with, start educating those around you. So what mm -hmm. I'll be telling like my younger sister or adopted younger sisters or brothers and we're young, who are young parents now, they might be of any age, they might be starting to have their children at 40s. They are still younger than us. So I see them as my adopted younger ones is to just keep singing it speak the language to the children at home, speak it to them at home, speak it to them at home. They will learn the English on television. They will Thank learn it anywhere. <laughs> they learn it everywhere. It's all spoken around there. They will learn it. Then that's them. And even if you don't come from the same language, I think that was part of our one as well, another barrier. Many of us were intermarried with, even if you marry a those state, you still marry somebody who doesn't speak your dialect. Mm -hmm. So some of us, we also use that as an excuse but you can speak like that lady I told you, the teacher in my daughter's school said, you speak your dialect, told me and my husband, you, I should speak my dialect, he should speak his dialect. But we were still complacent and you have to be consistent. Yeah. Don't start missing. Since, since I, I started watching Rashida's channel, <laughs> now that I realized when I'm speaking to my younger sister on the phone, he should live in the UK with two young children. Mm -hmm. I realized every of our sentences, we hardly speak them completely in ASA. <laughs> We always miss them with English because we know that some of we understand English. But yeah. when I'm speaking to my mom, because she does, she's in Nigeria, I'm speaking to her on the phone, because I know she doesn't understand English, I struggle sometimes to find the right word in the sentence to say for her to understand. Mm. So that's what I've told my sister and I've charged. I said, whenever we are speaking this to each other now, because Rashida told me that she speaks, she was speaking Yoruba to her sister, I'm telling her now, we must endeavor to speak ASA com completely on the phone. So if you can't speak ASA completely to me, how do I expect you and your husband to speak ASA to your children? Exactly. They are speaking to them, they are doing well, but I'm telling her, I said, your children are not the age, she, the eldest one is eight, going to be nine. And the youngest one is about four. I said, this is the age where you lose it. I keep thinking it as if you don't, if you're not consistent, because sometimes I'm speaking to her on the phone, I can overhear her speaking half ASA, half English to them on the background. I said, no you're going to lose it if you do this. Many of us, we are doing this and that was how we lost it. Mm -hmm. And also don't say, some people will say, I know some people try this. So my children can't understand, they don't speak. Mm -hmm. If they understand, they don't speak. How can they pass it on to the next generation? That, that language dies at that generation. You know, that's one. And also to us, the grandparents or aunties or uncles who are old that generation, the world now is a global village. Look mm -hmm. at me and Drushi, that she's had the other, she's had the, go across the pond. We are speaking to each other. That's right. There's Skype, there is WhatsApp. WhatsApp is like everybody on everybody's phone now. Talk when you talk to your grandchildren or your great grand nephews or nieces, whoever they are, you are the other ones. You are speaking to your nephews or your nieces' children or your grandchildren. Speak the language to them. Speak the language to them. And when they come to stay with you, if you are babysitting, obviously you, they are living far apart, even in the UK, you live far apart with, from them, or even in Nigeria, you live far apart from them. When they come home on holiday or come to you for one week or two weeks, endeavor to speak the language to them and give them the resources. There are a lot of resources. I have an auntie in Lagos who, as soon as she saw I, I created my channel mm -hmm. and she started, she bought the, the Saudi Agbes books to give to her, her children who are married so that her grandchildren can start learning. 
So let us do whatever we can, but above all, consistency and speaking the language is the only way, is the best way we can teach it. We can't expect them to learn it from books or learn it from television because it's a very, it's a minority language among them. Exactly. Good. Very good point. So it's always been my motto to just speak the language. You know, there's nothing easier because as you go from day to day, um, you'll be surprised at how it mounts up because you are you are basically adding, given every day. And before you know it, little children, little kiddos, they are, <laughs> they're speaking back to you and nothing is more beautiful. Nothing is more amazing than that. Um, you said something about, you said something about um, the fact that the mixture where we're, we're mixing the languages together, that is something that a lot of Africans, I think those who are colonized, anyone who is a victim of any nation and it's people who are a victim of colonization lost a lot of their languages. And I remember I was in India and I was talking to um, a friend there and she said, um, she, she was talking to her mom and I asked her, I said, how come you always mix? She was speaking her language to her mom, their, their language. Um, I think she was speaking Hindu, uh, one of the other, I think they have about five languages that I know. If it's more, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert, but I know at least five. So she was speaking, excuse me, <clears throat> to her mom and every other word was in English. And I said, I asked her, I said, why, why are you in certain English? She said, you know, that's just how we speak. She never thought about it. She, she said, I just never thought about it. And the same is with us here, everywhere we are as Africans, we always add English. I made a video where I talk about, you know, can you say any, can you make sentences without putting English word in it? Like just try to speak only fluent, uh, fluent Yoruba and not put any English in it. A lot of the people that commented told me they never knew any of those words that I used. Yeah. So, and that's how we gradually use. And I like the fact that you said now with your sister, you're now speaking, you have made it something, a requirement for your communication so that every time you speak, you only use a sound like um, words. It's, it's, it really helps. It, I'm telling you, my sister, and she's a younger sister, she will call me and that's the only way we could communicate to be to keep it private. Because if every other word is in, like if I say, I'll see you at 7.30. If I say, marry any 7.30, right? I just said Yoruba and then I ended it with 7.30. When I could have said, when I could have said, marry la go mejiabo. If I say 7.30, an English speaker who is, say I'm in, an, I'm in my office listening and my coworkers are there, they can hear, oh, she says something about 7.30. So I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So, and this is why, and, and you know, I mean, a very good point. Nobody else mixes the language. I mean, most languages are not mixed. We are the ones that do that, you know? Yeah. And we don't have the support. Our languages are very recessive to other um, to other environmental languages. Um, Spanish is thriving here, like you said. I mean, this is, I call US Spanish and English speaking. Those are the main languages. It's like Spanish is an official language in the US. No, we don't have that same support. You know, we Africans have a lot of languages, but we can still, there's a lot, enough of us to make this happen. And I commend you. I, you know, I really, really, um, I, you've opened my eyes, like I said. I, I am going to learn. I might, when I was looking at a song alphabet, <laughs> I, I saw I, B, D, A, F, E, G. I didn't see B, but then when I, I saw there's uh, additional text written, yeah. like B we, is We there. have the double consonant separately. Exactly. Some, and people, then, some, some people add it to it, but I just, it was much easier teaching it separately. I learned in primary school separately. Separately, so okay. I'm so, just and, digging on my elementary learning of ASA. I actually okay. only learned ASA in the first, I think the first two or three years of primary school. I mean, writing ASA, yeah. So, okay, so, and I know you have, and you have X, you have, um, you have, do you have V? You have V? In yeah, the U, V, we, Y, Z. Okay. A, B, D, A, F, E, G, E, E, J, K, L, M, N, O, O, P, R, C, T, U, V, we, Y, Z. All right, all right. Hey, guys, you've learned, <laughs> you've learned the alphabet too. That hey. was how we learned it in primary school. <laughs> 
It's amazing though. So I did hear that they took a lot of uh, languages out, out of the curriculum in Nigeria. Yeah. It's yeah. like, who yeah. makes these decisions? Why? Yeah. You know, so yeah. if the languages are out of the yeah. curriculums, the children are going to school and not understanding the languages, we are being Absolutely. we are being fed um, Western cultures, and then the ones that don't know, whose parents are not aware or not um, they're not conscious enough about the importance mm -hmm. of it until they actually, you know what? Until you leave the land, it doesn't hit you as strongly as it does no. when you're you know no. when you're not as much, with. not as much, maybe. not as yeah. much, yeah. So yeah, and so, and one thing I should add as well, I feel I'm, I really want to use this your platform to push this. I feel we should start forming um, Zoom clubs all over the world, wherever, so you can you can just use the look at you and me. We can use reasonable time zone, maybe on a Saturday if you are committed, you know, because sometimes you might be in a place when you are the only a speaker. Or you are the only one who is speaking it like Rashida, maybe probably the area locality you live, you are the only one. I know you US people, you have these your big, big houses far apart from each other. You don't you hardly even see your neighbors, not to talk okay. about mother <laughs> Yoruba speaking person. So so but we can we can use Zoom lessons to okay. try and find if you find one or two other ESA or Yoruba Igbo or Hausa or whatever effective uh Esako, Isoko. Bend libo or whatever you want to learn. If you find one or two across the globe, maybe Nigeria, East or West China, you can always connect somehow and start finding a way you can work together. Then there's always strength in number. And don't Absolutely. wait until you form a huge club. If it's just two or three people, start supporting supporting each other because it's one. There's one of my video where there are ten ways. If you have to that same video of learning se uh, several languages simultaneously, mm -hmm. there are ten key things you need to do to teach your so a child in another it's language. Seven. It's plan, consistency, enthusiasm, support, fun. You know all of that. When we're growing up, I'm not sure about you. You you grew up in the city. We have what we used to call. Now you watch television. We have all got taste by moonlight. In the no, I, I used to watch. I used to watch. Are you talking about the show Tales by Moonlight? No, not watching it. We Story. lived it. Story. We lived it. Story time. Yes. Yeah. So my In grandmother, the, my grandmother, yeah. every evening she sat us down. She lived with yeah. us. You know how your 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 yeah. um, grannies would come. So she lived. Oh, it was yeah. the best time of my life. I missed it so yeah. much. She's still alive. Yeah. But I just missed that sitting down and learning. I learned about aloe vera from my grandmother, and I, as a little yeah. girl, you know, you you miss. So go ahead <laughs> before I yeah. go into mine. Yeah, yeah. So we used to play together in the evening because then there was no like television and all of this. Were well, one or two people that have television here and there. So mm -hmm. we, our if we used to entertain ourselves, and there are some specific evenings they would say it's story time. So that evening is set aside to be story time. It might not just be you from the same compound, your friends from our next door neighbors can come around. And there were some people among us then who were gifted storytelling. There were some of us who were one story or two. Anytime it's your turn to tell stories, they say, oh, not again. The tortoise and his, the cricket story again. You're going to tell the same old story again. <laughs> Whereas there were some people who have vast knowledge, array of stories, they can always pick up one. And we used to also tell stories in the school as well. So if you learn a new story in the school, then you come and show it off one of those, your know, home uh, uh, storytelling group. And the adults will take, tell us stories as well, which their one is always very unique because yeah. they will add all the parables and all the idioms and, you know, it was so good. And we are losing all of that. I know. I mean, look at it. We've lost connection um, with the grandparents, like a lot of, so, so when I when I think grandparents back then they they were so elderly, you know yeah. what I mean? They were aged. Now we are younger. Grandparents are younger, but with that we have also migrated to other places. Yeah. And we have lost connection, even though we have this um, digital connector. We have uh, you know technology that is enabling so much. But we've lost that other side, that human to human touch. But you said that sh that still is an addition. We shouldn't let that stop us from promoting our cultures, our languages, and our traditions. Yeah. So, um, 
the, the storytelling, I guess, like you said, you, you said something about forming um, a group, Zoom group, or through whatever yeah. medium we want to use to have meetings, yeah. to speak whatever language you're speaking, form, um, connect with maybe three other families or a little more, and maybe yeah. meet weekly, like you said. You said this uh, yeah. before we started, you know, re recording this, that maybe, maybe two, um, meet every two weeks, right yeah. to make sure that the children are and that you, i think you said have a family teach have one family a mom or a dad teach that language for that week and then in another two weeks another parent will do that and we can sort of rotate it that way and that way we are promoting the languages and also involving the children who will be benefiting from it so that, i think that's just you know i i, I took notes <laughs> when you mentioned it so i'm going to make use of that and i urge everyone else who is watching if you care about language your language at all if you care about um making sure that you know the our languages do not die this is what you know you need to listen to this advice i'm just and, and if you want to put something out too let us see you because there could be other languages there right and if you um one who wants to learn more about his son language and its people and maybe cultures because um auntie mabel did a video where she talks about marriages um she she touched on she said she doesn't know much about other cultures as we will presume but that in Islam, certain um traditions go into into marriages and she talked about burial right so about how it is how it used to be what it cost back then <laughs> and what it is today you know everything is expensive these days so if you want to learn more about um Aeson, i urge you to please go to abel mabel i'm going to add her link to the bottom of this page and check her channel out it is on youtube you'll not be disappointed she talks about things she breaks things down thoroughly for you to understand and and her, she she has set this goal to promote the language and teach you how to speak right how to speak a song right yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right and, and one last thing i must say sorry i keep interjecting in your conclusion oh, is is that we should include the dads so it's very I important know, that's the, the absolute yeah, we should include very, the dads because yeah. most of the my age group or those who are younger who especially the ebos and the yorubas and as well the ebos i must give them this credit for that most of the ones I know over here, when they, they are speaking to their parents, they are always speaking Igbo, Igbo. And I will ask, how come you can speak? You grew up in Lagos, you grew up in the North. They will say, oh, we spoke not the Hausa outside or Yoruba outside, but in those, it was a rule that our dad said we must speak Igbo, Igbo at home. So I find that when a father makes the rule to speak a language, it stays it's just, it's, and they participate in speaking it. Mm. It goes a long way to 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 solidify that language be spoken at home. Yeah, that's a very good that's a very good point. What would you say to the homes that don't have fathers? Um, uncles and aunties, if the fathers are there, let them get involved because I find it's another thing that there are people are domesticating again. Mm -hmm. Some people like I had a video where somebody was talking about language and so the person was saying, well, it was actually we have a, a son. A mega forum on Facebook, which okay. I joined so that I can I can promote it there. I okay. can promote Asa language there. They were debating this. One man said, Oh, my wife is the one who spends all the time with the children. She's not speaking to them. That's why they don't speak Asa. <laughs> no, it's not her responsibility. The time, like somebody, somebody was saying, the time they are home, the time they are is actually the time you are home, you drop your English at the door and speak Asa all the time. So yeah. And to that's, the the reason, that's the reason why I'm saying that I understand that as a one parent family could be a father, only father, no majority single parent mother's family. Mm -hmm. They usually speak whatever you can speak to the children. If exactly. You if As you don't long. understand it, use all these resources all over and learn about the children. There's so many free resources, right? Yeah. They're there for you to use people. So please, we, I mean, today, there shouldn't be any excuse about why people are not speaking unless you're not able to speak, you know, then you that's understandable if you cannot speak the language, then find put your children immerse them in other ways, or just as you're teaching them English right teach them give them books 
turn on their TV shows, their shows in different languages now. And hopefully we'll have more, I said this to you some other time I said, hopefully we'll have more cartoons and things that will, you know, help children because if they're watching it, because you see they're in front of the television, which teaches them English, right? So if they can see cartoons in their languages, can you imagine? Because children don't, they don't care about what is being said. They just want to see da na 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 stuff moving around. Yeah. Yeah. And before yeah. you, before they know it, they're actually learning those words. And, you know, and then if it's reinforced in the house by the one speaker or whomever that is outside of their family, then they can do better. Um, there's a study that says that if a child, it says those who are learning um, um, English along with their native language, do better in school later. Absolutely. Yeah. And then those. Down my video is true. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Right. It, it said they do better than those who are learning English at the expense of yeah. their native tongue. It's it's like a very yeah. valid, valid, and I've seen that in my home. I've seen it in my home, and yeah. So it's been so nice talking to you. Thank you for taking yeah, the time. <laughs> I want you to, I want you to say something that you will like um, to, for the viewers to know before we close our conversation, but it's been a pleasure. Um, I've learned a lot. I, every day in a human's life is a learning opportunity. And um, when I was surfing the net and I saw your comment on my channel and I came to yours, I sat there when I eventually had time to watch. I sat there and I, my eyes were like, wow. And I've told two other people and this is how it goes. One person tells another and before we know it, we're helping to communicate this and pushing the languages forward. So please give us a closing remark. <laughs> yeah, what, what I would like to say, first of all, I say I thank you very much because I was also blown away, especially the way you can switch from your US American accent in English and switch to the Yoruba. <laughs> to make sure where you speak and the way you were conversing and engaging with your children, it was just so natural. Mm -hmm. So I have started sharing the videos with as many people as I can. And that is why I actually want to promote this so that, because in, we have more Yoruba speaking people in the UK among my circle of influence. So, and for me to show it out there for the younger generation who's still raising young children to say, mm -hmm. don't miss the boat. Yes. Don't miss this yes. this window. Don't miss this opportunity. Yep. And also, even those if you're already older, I have a video as well where I said if you're already older, your teens, twenties, thirty, or forties, your parents didn't speak to you. Like there are so many resources, and that video also cover other areas you can learn mm -hmm. the language and learn alongside your children. You know, so the, no, no, nothing is impossible. It's just the enthusiasm and the interest that you need. Yeah. So on that note, uh, I will say. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye in ESA today. So in this, and thank you as well. In ESA, Obulu is okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Why goodbye is Bakimboe. 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 Okay, so I'm not ready to say goodbye. So, <laughs> so I'm going mm -hmm. to say, so I want to um, correct something we try to remember. Um, this author, we try to remember her name. Her name is Chimamanda Ngozi, I think it's Adichie, right? Adichie, yeah. Okay, yeah. so we, we don't want you to be upset with us. We know you're not going to be upset, but we just want to say it right. <laughs> we want to get it right. Yeah. And then the second thing is to thank you again for taking time to talk to me. It's been eye-opening. It's been a pleasure. And I'm praying and I hope that everyone else who is wherever this video might go that people that it it does something if it reaches one person that it reaches more and that we all can learn from it um and also that um in in yoruba they they always um well in i i I'll, in english they say little drops of water as i said at the top of this conversation makes a mighty ocean so we need to we need to um, keep dropping into this ocean, to this bucket to make it full. And in Yoruba language, they will say, Koseni to mojola. Okay, no one knows tomorrow. Okay, so we don't know tomorrow, but we want to do our best to add to it today because today is all we have. So my people, Lord, please add <laughs> add your language. <laughs> speak yes, your language, yes. Joe. Speak your yes, language. So yeah, um, if you yeah. speak Esa, speak it to your children. If you're a child and you are wondering why your parents haven't taught you, 
and they cannot te you, teach you today, find your way. You have Auntie Mabel and they, there are others too who are putting information out. So try your best to use these resources. And there are, there's an application she mentioned. There's an app that you can just put on your phone and start learning the language at your own convenience. And there are also books that she mentioned at the top of this conversation that you can make use of. So go online, make use of the app, make use of the books and see how far it gets you because whatever you learn today will be useful for you tomorrow. Every day is a learning opportunity. So don't let us miss it. And again, um, I wanna say my name is Rashida, Rashida Jones. And um, you can find me on YouTube um, with my children and um, probably other children very soon talking about um, or just featuring children speaking the language. And you see me speak the language to my children as well. And I don't mix like Auntie Mabel said, don't mix your languages. I do not mix English with Yoruba. Never. I realized very early that that was that was that's one of the problems that we have as people. So if you have a dominant language, English in this case, over your own native tongue and you keep mixing it, well, sooner or later, the chance of killing the recessive language will be realized. So as she mentioned earlier, don't mix your languages at all. Don't mix your languages. And, and um, yeah, and, um, and any other person, any other person that want to learn learn any other language that is not Asa, it's not Yoruba, it's not Igbo, it's one of the ethnic minority group, just come to my channel and leave me a message. I will, I will help to find the resources how you can learn it. Because this mission, we have to be on it together. No ethnic minority language must be left out in Nigeria or in Africa. It's only the right. interest you need, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to add, I'm going to add um, Auntie Mabel's um, YouTube page to the bottom of this video so that you can click and access it as at any time that you want. If you're still watching, I want to say thank you so much. And I'm sure you've learned a thing or two because no one, no one person knows everything. You've also got information about a song language and where you can find resources. And you heard her say, you heard Auntie Mabel say that if you do not know where to find information or resources for your very own native language, that you can contact her. Again, her information is in the description below. And if you'd like your children to speak your languages, this video gives you so much information about what you can do. Hope you can make use of at least one of them and pass this, share this video with others who are in this position and are interested or don't know anything about a song language and want to learn or want to learn Yoruba or any other African language. Thank you so much for watching. It's been fun. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please subscribe. Like I said at the beginning, what are you waiting for? Subscribe. Thanks again, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.